So Ryan is also our expert at chicken wings. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Ex expert in what? Chicken wings. <laughs> Now, I don't know that you know that, but everybody out of New Orleans believes they're a chef. Yeah, is that right? <laughs> no, yeah. I didn't know that. And I, Oh, yeah, absolutely. Isn't that true? Oh, I mean, yeah, all true. the men in New Orleans are supposed to know how to cook. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. And so they all take great pride in their ability to cook. So okay. I was sort of a compliment to him that I, I would ask him to cook chicken, chicken wings. Chicken wings, wow. okay. This company was formed in 1993 by a previous colleague from mine at, a, at, at LSU, and it was uh, Doug, Doug Drennan. And in 2015, um, uh, my brother and I purchased that this company from his widow at the time. Okay. He passed, okay. And um, the company had worked very closely with LSU for 20 years, and we made sure that they did a lot of research at the the company and we did a lot of research at the university. Okay. To give you an idea, uh, small business innovative research grants are highly competitive at the federal level. Mm -hmm. This company had continuous funding for over 20 years, actually now oh, wow. 25 years. Okay. And at its peak, as many as three concurrent grant grants stocked on each oh, other. Okay. So they're okay. very, so it's a small company, mm -hmm. but very R&D intensive. And of course, that's because the technology we're talking about here didn't exist at the time and, it, and we're creating it as we go. Mm, okay. So the, um, then we have a, by the way, we now have a, an office you'll see tomorrow in New Orleans. Okay. You're in the R&D office right now. The New Orleans office is our production center. Okay. Mm, okay. And then we have also in Colorado where my brother lives, uh, around Boulder, we have a sales office with another engineer and an assistant up there. So we'll uh, shortly be expanding that Denver office to include more engineers uh, okay. such as our main uh, purpose right now, our, our focus has been last year, so we started, was to expand into the wastewater area. Okay. Being already very well established in aquaculture, mm -hmm. being very well established in zoos, okay. and that type of water support systems. And actually, we've been very busy with aquaponics since we took over the company. We've had, I would say, at any time during the last year and a half, we've had an aquaponics system under construction mm -hmm. in the facility. So okay. if you go down there, you're going to see. You're gonna see one almost every time. Okay. They're packing it up. They're they're tuning it or doing something. Doing something to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, with this, this is one company. We actually have an intellectual property company mm -hmm. that has patents. We've received one in 2016, one in 2017. Okay. We have several international patents okay. going on now. So this is all innovative stuff on the cutting edge. Cutting edge. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the whole uh, philosophy we have here has been to simplify fish systems uh, so that there there's a minimum number of failures. If, if you have an interruption in a fish system that goes for, you know, a couple hours, you might lose every fish you have in the building, mm -hmm. and then you're out of business. Mm -hmm. It's not like you lost a crop. You're out of business. business yes. You lose your customers. You lose everything. So we look at this more like operating in a hospital than looking at operating a farm. I see. We have to have systems that are robust and allow somebody not to be successful one season, but season after season. season okay. And to do that, after studying it, and I actually have written some papers on this, um, we, we advocate what's called a consolidation process, that is we eliminate every every point of failure we can in okay. that sequence. Okay. That means removing parts, simplifying things. Okay. okay? And lately, for years, we've been arguing that we're designing systems with no moving parts and require no electronics to operate. Mm, okay. That being said, we do have process control in our back pocket if you're inclined to it, but we advise you that if you start doing that, you better have a technician that can run it, can run it. you're going to have potential failures. Mm, I see. I see. And, and overall, we want to stabilize and economize production. Okay. And I must say, why well, I got this, this is original laboratory system. This is... Uh, done in 91, 1991 or okay. 1992. And we have this one, it's a, one of my favorite slides because it, it illustrates what we're really doing here. You know, the beads float mm -hmm. and the solid sink. Mm -hmm. And in our propeller wash unit, all we have to do is stir it up and get everything floating. And then when you stop, the beads float and the solid sink and okay. we have separation. Okay. We've done that without water loss. 
Okay. Where a sand filter, which is sort of a similar technology to an extent, mm -hmm. when you back flush the filter, you use thousands of gallons of water, water and you yeah. have to do something with that water. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a fish system, you lose more water in a week than you have in the system. Mm. So it's no longer a closed system. Right, it's right. No longer water. I see, I see. So all our designs are based to take, use this floating media that that is uh, has that basic characteristics of beach flow. Okay. Now, who's, was this... Is this your particular idea right here for the beads? And so, so uh, the beads, actually, I give credit to one of my students, a uh, young man, Doug Wimberly, uh, okay. about 1989. I sent him out the door and said, find me something that floats. And it turns out that right up the street is Dow Chemical and Exxon that produced this stuff by the millions of tons per year. <laughs> <laughs> it's laying all up and down our railroad tracks. By, by the millions. <laughs> Now wait, hang on a second. Perfect. I thought that the idea for bead filters came from Mardi Gras. Yeah. Uh -oh. uh, 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 I tried Mardi Gras beads. They sink. <laughs> they yeah, sink. Okay. okay. And uh, so that's uh, so that you know this is the way most of this has been developed. In fairness, okay. His eyes, the professor would say, "I need this." This, okay. And then you go do it, and the student would come back, and if he failed, I'd get another student. <laughs> okay. <laughs> After yeah. two or three students, yeah. I would deduce I was wrong, and or occasionally a smart student would tell me that I'm wrong, mm, and then we would move forward. Okay. Okay. So it's not. I don't want to take credit for all of these developments. Okay. I'm probably the the guy that comes up with the basic concept. Right. We've been dozens and dozens of students and, and professionals that worked on this over the years. Okay. So I want to yeah, go here. So here's the, we use a polyethylene plastic bead. Mm -hmm. And the poly and plastic, plastic is the same thing to make bottle caps out of. Okay. Low density polyethylene plastic and the cups that, plastic cups you have in your house. Yes. And everything else is plastic. Okay. Okay. And it is produced very cheaply. It's a spherical bead, typically, that they put into the molding process. It's about an eighth of inch in diameter. Okay. Right. Um, what happens when we put that into a static bed that is an unmoving bed and pass water through it is the first thing it has to do is act like a sand filter. It's going to capture solids. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it's relatively effective taking almost everything in practice down to about 30 microns okay. with multiple passes in okay. the fish mm -hmm. system. And it will go after lower stuff like algae down here about 5 microns. Okay. All right. So so it's very effective that. And you can imagine it's a gravel or plastic bed. It's mm -hmm. going to capture the solids that pass through just yes. like any other thing. Same thing yeah. But with this media, it turns out that we can actually grow bacteria on the surface. And what happens is we grow bacteria that, that consume um, dissolved organics, or what we usually call BOD in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, they're called heterotrophs, and they grow a film on there. Mm -hmm. And you can see that film. Tomorrow when you go look at an mm -hmm. operating facility, mm -hmm. I'll show you how a bead should look. Okay. It should be coated with a brown coating. Okay. If you see plastic, you're overwashing, I always say. So. Okay, I see. And that when you once you grow that layer, then nitrifying bacteria, which are critical to any fish system, start to grow in that film. Mm -hmm. And as we wash, what happens is, is the nitrifiers migrate to the surface because they live longer, mm -hmm. and they just statistically end up there. And they, once they get to that surface, they stick. Mm -hmm. And the heterotrophs, which are the very common bacteria, are washed off when we back flush. Okay. So way out, the analogy I use, which works for me most of the time, is I'm trying to grow centipede grass mm -hmm. in my front yard. The only way to do that is to mow the tr mow the weeds out. You right. basically cut off the weeds on the top. Right, right, right. And you get the good quality grass sticking to the bottom. Gotcha. It's the same thing here. It's turned out that the more we wash and the the longer this bead gets older, the better nitrifies. So it's is turned that out right? to be very good. Okay, so it's not. So the, the nitrifying bacteria, they don't get washed off? There are scientific studies mm -hmm. actually and observations because they actually sliced the film and measured the density of different bacteria okay. that prove that the bacteria stick to the surface, the nitrifying bacteria stick to the surface very well. So if I wow. go through a film, mm -hmm. oh, you know, I'm going to say that your hair, by the way, human hair is about 100 microns. So stack five human hairs thick, mm -hmm. that's a good biofilm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So it's still pretty thin. Mm -hmm. And if you cut through that, you'll find the heterotrophs on the top. Yeah. Okay. And the nitrifier is near the bottom. Oh, okay. 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 And is it, if I wash it, I'm going to wash off that top. The top. Okay. And I expose mm -hmm. the nitrifier. So we mitigate and optimize the system by cutting the grass 
Okay, I and see. Taking the tri the weeds out. Uh, what are the heterotrophic bacteria? What are they doing? The heterotrophic bacteria take out dissolved dissolved organics. Okay. So, Sugars, starches, mm -hmm. those common things that are in feeds, they take out. Okay. Uh, as those heterotrophic bacteria take apart, for example, a protein, they release ammonia, oh, the ammonia. which has to be picked up by the nitrophiles. Okay. So it's two classes of bacteria. The big difference is they, they eat different things, right, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. But the big difference is a heterotroph grows very quickly. It'll reproduce every 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. So I always use the example, if I drop one heterotroph on this desk mm -hmm. and it's at the end of the day it's going to have two times ten let's see two two to the uh, 47th bacteria at a minimum in this room <laughs> which means we all suffocated gentlemen <laughs> okay. if you give it enough to feed it, okay. it can reproduce that fast, fast. Mm -hmm. if i drop that one nitrifier on the table and we wait 24 hours at the end of the day you have two if you're lucky yeah okay so you can see that that's what caused a problem in a mismanaged film. Yeah, I see. You end up the 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 bacteria bury the heterotrophs bury, bury the, the nitrifying. Okay.